Okay, let's get started. So I want to welcome you all to the presidential session and make sure you have the right title. It's Technology, Digital Media, and Implications for Learning Sciences because we have gotten conflicting information on where to be. So welcome you all. I hope uh, you want to be here and join us uh, in a conversation. My name is Yasmin Kafai from the University of Pennsylvania, and I have the great pleasure and honor to chair the session with two seminal representatives, Jim Paul G. from James Paul G. from the Arizona State University and Luis Gomez at the outer from UCLA. And so here is what we're going to do. After providing just a short introduction to the key themes, and I'm entirely responsible for those, neither Lewis nor Jim uh, know about those really. I like to introduce the two speakers, so there's a little element of surprise here. Uh, and then give them room to present their ideas and positions on technology, digital media, and implications for the learning sciences. Uh, and after that, uh, I was asked to respond, whatever that means, uh, and then we'll open up for uh, a Q&A uh, that. So I think there are obviously several aspects that make these timely topics for a session. I would argue that we have uh, experienced actually during the last quarter century some really fundamental shifts on how we um, interact. The first shift I would say is one of access, whoops. And I'm very fond of this image. Many of you are probably too young to remember what this is, but this was a walkthrough computer, an exhibit that was designed uh, for what was then the Computer Museum in Boston. And a good 25 years ago, we were so interested but so distant from technology that we needed to make the machine so big that we could touch it. And so you have a gigantic uh, uh, drive uh, um, a chip, a uh, keyboard there, a mouse. Um, and today, of course, that is no longer uh, true because the Technology walks with us in our pockets and our wrists if you check the devices you have uh, with you. And it seems that access is really no more an issue. And kids are probably one of the most avid adapters of the technology, and many of them have more, but sometimes perhaps not always as complex interactions with technologies outside of school. So I think that is a big shift, I mean, we have seen in technology over the last 20 years in terms of access. But I think the question for today's panel, uh, has that shift in terms of having more technology available right next to us and on us really helped us to improve learning and teaching with technology? And the second shift I want to talk about is one of perception. And here are two book covers from about 20 years ago, and the one to the left was from Eugene Provenzo on Nintendo Kids, and it actually picked uh, uh, a painting from Friedrich Hundertwasser showing a brain, and I think you don't really need to say much more on what the content of the book is about what video games were doing to our uh, brains. And so for a long, long time, uh, uh, people uh, in academia as well as in the public have considered games, in particular video games, a waste of time to quote one of James' uh, chapter titles. But today, we really have a very different conversation about games. They're actually considered good for us. I mean, and uh, a lot of the discussions we had about the violence, the stereotyping, they're still there. So I, one, I mean, so we actually think about putting games into classrooms for learning and teaching to promote academic content and computational fluency. So I hope these will kind of provide the ground for some questions that we actually address then as well as now. Uh, when we think about designing, researching, assessing educational efforts for home, school, and online, how do we address the still critical challenges, not just of access, but in particular of equitable participation? Uh, how can we create more inclusive learning environments, whether they concern schools or places inside and outside?
outside. And I think we're very fortunate that we have both Jim G and uh, Luis Gomez here to share their thoughts uh, on those issues. Both of them are member of the National Academy of Education. And Jim is uh, quite interesting because he has a whole esteemed career in uh, language and learning and literacy before uh, a good uh, 15 years ago he made, was it a right or left turn or a 180 degree turn? <laughs> And, and thought about uh, actually looking at video games uh, as a place for learning and bringing uh, his lens of language and literacy to these fairly complex environments uh, and what they had to teach us about those very topics. And this was interesting because, again, people then, uh, to some extent still today, didn't consider games a topic worthy of learning and literacy. Uh, and since then, he has written many more uh, books on games and learning. And the last two books in particular are focusing on the general state of education. Luis Gomez is the chair uh, of the UCLA Department of Education, where you're done. Oh my god, congratulations. Um, <laughs> oh god, I hope he has nobody here from UCLA. I was there for 14 years, so that's I love it while I did it. <laughs> Good, good. So, um, and he, for his career, uh, bef actually before working at uh, Bell Labs, researching impact of technology, has tried to understand on how school districts and larger systems implement change with technology. He's working very closely with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching to tackle those critical issues and and has a forthcoming book, uh, Improving a Practical Discipline for Making Our Schools with Colleges Work. So he is really adopting a much broader perspective, not focusing on just one, one technology, but as learning as systems as a whole. So I'm pleased today that uh, both of them will kind of share with us what are some ways we can think about learning and literacy in regard to technology and digital media, and then we can speculate what the implications for the learning sciences are. And so with that, I hand it over to Jim G. Do you, um, we, somebody might have to do the, there is uh, a. I'm gonna go down. Uh oh. <laughs> and I have, the cl I have the clicker, so. You know what, I'm here all off the stage. <laughs> so uh, let's see how this turns on. Mastering technology. I can give you mine, <laughs> no, that, that's <laughs> Well, I never even got the pencil right. Um, okay, so you can't, Lewis, you're gonna have to tell me how to do this, I don't know. Should I count two, then it's three of us? <laughs> better picture of Lewis than of me. Wow. <laughs> no, that was from the internet, and there were the first three coming up, <laughs> right, so I, I do okay. not discriminate. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to start while that thing gets on so we don't take up a lot of time. Um, one of the things that I want to stress, and, and it's part of the theme of the conference, is, is equity. Um, and I want to start with the fact that w the United States, as m many of you know, is in pitiful shape, <laughs> equity-wise, pitiful. We have the largest inequality we've had in our history. And we have quite a signal achievement. I, this is really quite outstanding. You know, since I entered education, left linguistics, the big topic was, you know, uh, the, how do we get minority kids to be able to close the gap with white kids uh, in schools? And yet now, after 40 years, the gap by class has passed the gap by race. And the so-called white working class, that's an oxymoron because they don't have jobs or they have very poor ones, now has, is the only part of our population with downward mo mo uh, mortality. That is, they're the only one whose life expectancy is going down. They have the highest suicide rate in the country and the largest amount of drug addiction. Now, this is not, this uh, uh, fact is not because we improved uh, the black-white gap. We didn't. We just allowed bigger problems, other problems to go in it. So now everybody's immiserated, um, except a tiny number of elite people. 
Now, there is a deep problem in this. When you have massive inequality, and the literature on this is overwhelming, um, you get very bad health both mentally and physically, which is what we've got across the board with uh, a tremendous number of people. You also get politicians like Donald Trump. And, uh, the, and, and this correlation, why, this has been known peers, why when there is high inequality in a society do you get very bad health and a lot of social problems? Uh, a teenage pregnancy, broken families, drug addiction, why do you get it? What's the mediating factor? And the mediating factor appears to be what I will call dislocation. Human beings need to feel that they matter. And, and they need to feel they matter to others and that what they do matters and that they participate. Um, I'll, I'll click it from here. Um, and if they don't, they get sick. And one of the things in, in much of the literature on drug addiction, because it's become great, there's a wonderful saying that John, John and Harry has, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. The literature on drugs shows that if people get connected to others in a sense where they count, where they find meaning in what they do, that their drug addiction winnow, winnows away. And what's happened in America is a tremendous amount of people feel dislocated from others, from the society. And so I'm going to argue to you, and this is relevant to learning sciences, I'm going to argue to you that we need to talk about locating people. They need to be undislocated. Whether they're black, white, brown, they need to be dislocated. Or all we will do is go to hell together. Right? Now, um, Let's see if this works. Uh, I will get to the point of arguing to you that chickens matter here. We're down to this, by the way. This, I've tried every other remedy, but I'm gonna, my last one is going to be chickens. Um, now, uh, so I have argued, and this is what I, my reading of the current work on the brain and learning sciences, that uh, deep learning has these features. We learn from experience, but not from any old experience. They have to be well-designed experiences and well-mentored, because there's too much to pay attention to. So somebody has to help guide our attention. They have to be designed to guide our attention. They have to be well-mentored. This is whether you're a child or a newbie adult learning something. And these experiences work best for storing and long-term memory and using for future preparation for action. They work best when you have an action to take and it is essential that you care about the outcome of the action. What that means is something has to be at stake for you or you don't deeply process the material. That is the core of learning. And the way humans work, Martians may not work this way, uh, people don't learn unless you trigger those features. And they do not seem to be predominant features in the testing regime in school. Now, uh, I have argued that games are good because they generate just those features. They put you in an experience with a surrogate body. They are well-mentored and well-guided by the very design of the game and the game designers. And they are built around problem-solving and actions that you're highly motivated to, so, uh, to solve. So what I've argued through my career in games is not that we should use games, that, but that they are uh, a, an exemplary uh, platform for how learning should work, whether you have a game or not. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's why they're good. But here's another thing that is interesting to me about games. Games generate what I call affinity space. Now, affinity space is a case where in a game, if p uh, games are about problem solving, right? And if, but if you get into that problem solving and you really begin to get a deep interest or passion, then very often you take it out of the game. You go band with other people to do all sorts of other stuff. And you then make a connection to those people, right? And so let me give you an example. Uh, here is what I, an affinity space. Affinity space is a space of spaces. It's so just like, you know, there's cities, with towns within cities, within states. And this is for a game called Dota 2. This is typical of what many, many games do. Dota 2 has hundreds of characters, all sorts of statistical stuff you have to do. And if you, if you really get interested in Dota 2 and you want to play it well, then you actually visit a whole bunch of other spaces than the game. And you can do it. So if you want help, uh, you know, teaching, 
uh, mentoring, you can go to some sites where there are tutorials, and there can be didactic ones or participatory ones or interactive ones. There are sites with libraries of materials you can study. There are sites with guides written by the player. All this is written by the community of people doing this. There are uh, sites where you can get a coach. The coach will either come in the game with you or can coach you in video or, could just, you know, whatever way. You can go to sites where you can spectate other people playing the game. They're playing in multiplayer in teams. And then you can uh, have annotations or coaching with that or you know, anything you want. And uh, you can go to theory crafting sites where people have explicated the entire statistics. Uh, you can go to forums where you can discuss it. And you're just, just imagine, people are moving through all these spaces, and these are, they're locating themselves. And as they move to these spaces, and in each space, there's teaching and learning going on. But in some spaces, you might be doing the teaching. In some spaces, you might be doing the learning. And in each space, you can choose to teach and learn in different ways and with different people, depending on how it's going to work for you. So that's why I call it a distributed teaching and learning system. There are teachers everywhere, but they're not all in one place. So uh, as you move through these spaces, you are literally located, although it's virtual space, you're located in those virtual spaces, but what you're doing is connecting to that group of people through the passion for Dota 2. Now, this way of organizing, that is taking a shared passion for problem solving and then moving through multiple spaces uh, by, and thereby making a connection to other people has become completely uh, 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 prolific in the world out of school. But these affinity spaces, that is these spaces of spaces, are not the remotely new. When I was a child, I lived in one, and almost exclusively. I was raised a very devout Catholic with only cat. I saw my first Protestant in college. <laughs> and, and actually was quite frightened, because I was told they'd kill us. Um, and, uh, but, so, uh, but see, what, what, what did it mean in those old, old days to be a Catholic? Well, you went to a Catholic school, and then you also had Catholic homes, and you visited each other's homes, you went to the church, you went to events that were sponsored. There was a one kind of virtual one, Catholic TV. You went to other churches, social events, political events, all with the Catholics. They're just, you, but these are all physical spaces except for the TV. But notice one thing is teaching and learning went on in every space, not just the school. See, the school is that the church did teaching and learning. The homes did it. The, every space was responsible for teaching and learning. And different people did it in different places. And they all moved across the places. So teaching and learning is distributed. Notice that this does tell us wh why some schools are so isolating. Because this, the Catholic school is completely one space among many and immersed in that space, supported in teaching and learning by every one of those other spaces. That's very powerful compared to the school being kind of detached from all the other spaces. So the thing that is new today uh, is that there are, uh, uh, we've always had these affinity spaces, but now they, they, we have on the internet ones that are mainly made up of virtual spaces. However, the world is also full, this is where the chicken comes in, uh, is full of uh, spaces that do blend both, right, physical and real. Uh, and I had this experience, my wife and I uh, moved to a little farm and we raised animals, including chickens, and we knew absolutely nothing. It's a rural town and it's with the, uh, it's a town that's classic, a white working class town with a lot of social problems, but except for where the farms are because there's only animals and they don't have any addictions. Um, and, but we knew nothing. The term green acres came up many times with our neighbors. Um, but we've learned, but how did we learn? Well, we went to the, some of these physical spaces. I don't know, if could you see that, like the tractor store? Various, and I took a chicken class at the tractor store, <laughs> sat on a bale of hay. Uh, there's internet sites with vets and stuff, and there's, so you, you and, and we move through these, and when you go like to the feed store, they ha they'll have people stand around, tell you what to do, they'll, they're all, so pretty soon you're just moving through those and you realize you're getting all this teaching. Then you go back and you try it out with your animals, and maybe you get a real passion for the chickens or the goats, and then pretty soon you're teaching a little bit about what you've learned. Uh, but notice this is a mixture. This is very typical, by the way. So you could raise chickens or you could have any problem you want, and, uh, but it's a mixture of the physical and uh, the real. Now, here's why I'm telling you this. 
because the mo I'm going to argue to you, the modern world is outside of school, very organized around locations, that is affinity spaces where people get an interest, go in to get help, sometimes it kindles to a passion, and then they start moving to physical and virtual spaces. And in the act of being located, they become connected. And then, and I brought up the chickens once because it's an excellent documentary about chick people raising chickens for shows. And in one of the do one scenes of the documentary, a woman says, I was an alcoholic for most of my life. I really didn't take that good care of my kids. She really got into this chicken thing and showing, she made a very bi uh, big connection to chickens. And all of a sudden, she's not an alcoholic anymore. And of course, what she did is she didn't connect to the, ch she's connected to the chickens. But the chickens connected her to a whole group of people with shared passions. All of a sudden, she belongs. All of a sudden, what she does has meaning. And all of a sudden, she's not a basket case anymore. Right. Now, my last example is this is the little girl, uh, Alex, who is at 15 when we studied her. And she is a fan. She writes fan fiction out of The Sims. So that means she takes pictures from the game The Sims, photoshops them, puts uh, stories with them page by page, like a graphic novel, and does it as a series. And she has, she started in this, and she, so she went to Sims fan fiction affinity space, various spaces that would teach her photoshopping, doing stuff, joined all these people got her own website and in the beginning she couldn't spell she couldn't really write and she plagiarized uh, the people say hey we'll, we'll help you. you you can't do those stuff but you're welcome to do this we'll help you she's now quite a star she won't talk to us anymore because she hasn't got any time now. Um, and so she knows now how to do Photoshop, how to maintain her fans through various uh, internet stuff. And she's, she's a, a rock star. Now, I once listed, so this is an example of her affinity space, the personal websites, the Sims game, the Photoshop stuff. You know, she just, she and the others move through this. She as a person with thousands of readers. Um, and, uh, but I, t I wrote down one day what she had mastered. What had she learned? Because, but she does teaching in these sites now, too. She'll learn sometimes and teach sometimes. She knows, so I, I'm not going to go through this because I don't want to take up more time. Here's the list of things, all of them technical. Many, I mean, um, some, how do you do websites? How do you Photoshop? How do you keep a fan community going? Um, how do you write these genre fictions? You know, the, on and on and on. It sounds like a great list of 21st century skills uh, that she's picked up. Uh, she's located. She's, she finds meaning in what she does. And here is what she gets from her uh, fans. Um, I love Lincoln Heights is her m most famous series. When I read it, it always seems to cure my sadness, and it has actually helped me deal with a lot of depression and shit I've forced to learn with lately. I can't wait until the next chapter that hurry up. In other words, she's, con she's now allowing teenagers who are hurt and sick to connect, to locate, and she's doing therapy, the therapy we need. Now, here's the, the moral of this story for us. Uh, the, I've listed here a set of spaces in an affinity space. Uh, it, can anyone guess what affinity space this is? As what is the passion that makes people share g journeys through these spaces? Avoidance. What? Tax avoidance. These, these, this is the space of how rich people hide their money from taxes, how people who run governments hide the money they plundered. Uh, it, it is a very, it was exposed through a hacking of the leading law firm. And um, it, when this all came out and we found out how intricate, and it, by the way, it's just organized just with teaching, mentoring, the whole thing. Uh, if we, if the journalists who exposed this concluded what this shows is only suckers pay taxes that most people don't, anybody with money that, that is, doesn't pay them. And uh, this is an extremely well-organized thing that you need to get, just like with the chickens. They're not sitting on bales of hay, but they're, it's like the chickens. Now, here's my question to us. If the bad guys can build something this good that connects real world and virtual worlds into interests and passions that make people located and belong, we better start doing it or this, the equity will erode the culture altogether. Okay, thank you.
since I have to navigate my own computer, I, I can't, I can't, I gotta wait. You gotta wait a second. I'll be right with you. <laughs> Just a second. Uh, here we go. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, I, I, I'm going to start with uh, a bit of a reflection. Whenever people ask me to, to have a conversation about technology and its connection to learning or digital media and the sort, I'm often put in the mind of um, my, my late great friend and great scholar, um, Jan Hawkins, who said to me in a conversation, I mean, she may have said it in a talk or something to others, but she said to me in a conversation, you know, technology is neither cause nor effect. It's, and she meant by that it's really much more, it's much bigger than all that. And um, I, I want to talk about what it takes to get from a bit of an idea that might encapsulate, it, encapsulate itself in a technology to something that actually helps somebody and maybe a lot of somebodies. And I think over the course of the better part of my career, those of us who are in that place I really think find ourselves trapped in what I'm going to refer to today, the zone of wishful thinking. And so the zone of wishful thinking kind of goes like this. You got a promising idea, which I'm sure lots of folks here have and sort of are walking around in their back pocket and they think it's a one, you think it's a one in a billion idea and you sort of, you're holding it close to yourself. Uh, and you have this aspiration to deliver on that promise, perhaps even at scale, and maybe even disrupting some inequality. I, I, I bet you if I scratch many of the people here, it'll describe you. Um, and there you live. <laughs> <laughs> in the zone of wishful thinking. And smack dab in the middle of the zone of wishful thinking, you will run into everyday practice. And inside everyday practice, which sort of disciplines everyday practice, our beliefs, values, people's local theories of action, in general, context. And your good idea, my good idea, is going to smash into the shoals of context. It's going to run into local organizational constraints, human capacity of one sort or another, the particular funds of knowledge you find. Um, it's going to run into, because we all fall victim to this, it's going to run into what I want you to do with my thing versus what you want to do with my thing. And it's going to run into local technical skill and know-how required and what, what your thing requires. And it's also going to run into, because the organizations are real and the way schools in particular work, it's going to run into the organizational aim, I'm sure you've all heard it, the organizational aim to roll stuff out versus the organizational aim to learn. So those are the, sh the rocky shoals. And what happens when you run into the Rocky Shoals is legend, of which this is one. Many of you may have come across in your time in the world um, the Birmingham One Lap Per Child XO experiment. And these are a couple of pictures from local Alabama newspapers and the headlines that accompany them. One is most Birmingham classrooms not using XOs much. But supporters urge, don't give up on them. Another said, 
Exo laptops are well, well received by teachers and students, but use is limited. In these quotes live, I think, two truths. Truth one, this was a well-conceived thing. For this long list of good ideas that we know about, have read about, having to do with you know, sort of widespread distribution of computers to young people. And if you read the technical reports, the evaluations and so forth of what happened there, you'll also learn that they were great examples of success. There were examples that people reported of student joy in the work, learners taking a, a sense of ownership from what they do, creative productions, like some of those using a thing created by our great colleague here, Scratch, uh, tools, and, and in, inventing tools for scientific investigation. But you also learn when you delve into this and other examples, this is not unique. You learn that there was lower than hope for use. You learn that unstable political support to wreck it. You could learn that there's less the application than we would have wanted to the core aspects of schooling. Teachers and other staff were unprepared for the know-how necessary to do this work. You learn that it's a tremendous pressure on the infrastructure to accommodate all this change. And this variability, I want to argue, when it comes to innovation, is the norm. Each of these things you see here are either a study of, of some particular set of innovations that report this kind of variability, or um, an evaluation that reports it. And, the, er, and where the earliest one is probably Sesame Street, which this is exactly what was reported when Sesame Street was evaluated, that there was, it was underutilized, and it's a particular kind of underutilization. It was underutilized by the people it was designed to help. Right? It was designed to goose literacy and other things in challenged communities. It wound up doing those things for mostly other communities. And each of these, in one way or another, report or imply that these innovations had that characteristic, underuse by the people who really were it was designed for, differential outcomes, differential patterns of participation, and negative impact is often, as I said, associated with disadvantaged people and communities. And I think, in part, this comes about because of perspectives on execution, which is this, and I, and I want to argue, as we go a little bit further, that this is really, at its core, at its heart, a problem of execution, of making things happen on the ground. So I think that you can have what I, what I maybe, what I call an, e an equality-driven view of execution, that is, you start with an innovation, it comes headlong into multiple contexts, and you have a view, a single view, of what it looks like in, in use. Or you can have an, equi an, an equity-driven view of execution. You have an innovation, it comes into multiple contexts, and you expect that the cast, the look, the feel, the opportunity, for the innovation will look different by context. And it's important to realize that in this equity-driven view, you accept that the price of implementation, the price of execution, the level of investment that it takes will not be uniform, will not be uniform. Insensitive ex execution, I want to argue, reproduces inequality. The students and settings most in need often experience the smallest change because of these reasons, because of less use, because it has been reported for year over year, what you might call desiccated application. You look at the thing as it was intended, and you look at the thing that was used, and you kind of don't recognize the two. It places significant press on the organization. It requires know-how that we just don't have. So, so Bertram Russell said science, what it, what it, what it, science tells us what we can know, but what we can know is, is, is little if we forget how much we cannot 
no, when we become insensitive to the many things of great importance. And I think often, when we take up innovations, that's in some sense what rollout mentality is like, not paying attention to all the things that we might believe to be important. So, W. Edwards Deming, who invented quality improvement in the Western world, said, when he was talking about Goals 2000 in the year 1991, he said, he said that education reform is miracle goals without methods. And if we don't want our modern reforms to be a redo of that, and if we continue to do what we always have done, we will continue to get what we've always gotten. And we need to figure out a way to interrupt that. So typically what we get, I think, is shown here. With some, we get a lot of variation when an innovation hits these rocky shoals. But it often is the case that in, in the context of that innovation, the innovation serves some people, those blue people, extraordinarily well. And it serves some people, those green people, not so well. What we would like to see ourselves be able to accomplish is something more like this, where we serve everybody a lot better, but in particular, we don't, the results we get for the blue and green people in terms of the performance we care about is not distinguishable because of their blueness and their greenness. Variation in execution, as I said a moment ago, lives in work processes. New technologies imply organizational processes, and they come in contact with local school processes that are very complex. Even the best innovations are going to experience execution variation. And when you, get when you solve the execution variation, you create sort of a new thread of activity, which is what that's meant to show. But too often, we use low-powered strategies to make execution happen. And I'll say a little bit about what those low-powered strategies are. Sometimes they're mandates. We get to a place and we say, well, you just do this, right? We set targets. We hold individuals accountable. Sometimes we say, well, I can just get this done if you give me more stuff. Or you said, well, if I just wait long enough, <laughs> something good will happen. Uh, or you say, somebody else someplace knows how to get it done and maybe it'll show up. Oh, let me back up. So, so I have a reference to this later, but our colleagues in, in sort of healthcare improvement, a guy named Peter Margolis in particular, he studied these low-powered solutions and he said that when you use them, you can expect a little less than 10 failures for every time you try to execute. That's pretty high. Two failures, I'm sorry, for every, time, every 10 times you try to execute. I want to give a little brief example of what that could look like. In our group, we asked a bunch of science teachers to use a software application called Write to Learn, which is, at the, which is meant to help students generate critical summaries. And it has, uh, it supports reading comprehension, it provides automatic scoring and immediate feedback. But we also tried to map just the number of processes it would take to be executed properly from the time a teacher decides that he or she wants to use Right to Learn to get students to use it successfully. So a lot of processes involved. And so, we argue, based on Margolis' work, you have to attend to all those processes. You, and the best way to attend to them is to pay attention to real-time failures, to learn from failures from high performers and low performers. You have to have vigilance in operation. People have to remind each other what good looks like. Because often, we forget to tell one another when we are failing and, and take the responsibility to correct community behavior. We have, to have a, we have to really be committed to resilience. We have to care about failures. We have to recognize that everybody has expertise that can help innovations become, important, become successful. And Margolis and colleagues argue that at least in implementing complex medical 
operations, when they do these things, you get less than one failure in every 100 execution attempts. So this is not a technology example to close, but in the city of Chicago, they're experiencing a radical increase right now in the rate of high school graduation. Now, there's a, I should say up front, there are a lot of questions one could ask about the quality of the, the high school degrees that people are getting and so forth, and so it's not perfect. But I will tell you, when I used to work in Chicago, and I, when I, when I started working there in 1993, people routinely expected around 40% of black males to graduate from high school. It was routine. They couldn't envision you know, upwards of 80, 85, 90 people graduating on a regular basis. Could not. So, and what did they do in that work? They, they had a fundamental shift at the Center for, for the CCSR, the Chicago Center for School Research. A fundamental shift in how they interacted with practitioners. And the, and, the, and the civic elite. Rather than simply saying about this or, an, or another big policy initiative that it worked or it didn't work, they took local capacity building with data seriously. Rather than just saying at the end, um, something like end of course exams or something like that is not gonna work or college preparatory curricula, they took seriously the idea of building indicators that might help early on to tell you who's gonna fail later on. So in, most, in Chicago, the data told them in ninth grade who was likely to do bad in 11th grade or 12th grade. They just took those data seriously and tried to turn them into practice relevant tools. So summing up, if you wanna make change happen and you wanna have technological innovations that really matter to lots of people, you gotta expect variation and you have to know without attention to variation, we, will we sort of will reproduce inequity in innovation. But inequity lives in process execution. You gotta remember, I think, that social justice is in the details. It's just not in high concept. It's possible to engineer equity, and you but I think one of the keys to making it happen is having radical and sharp attention to failure, because radical and sharp attention to failure leads to a kind of organizational and individual know-how. I want to leave you with a quote from David Cohen and colleagues um, who said, responding positively ref to reforms, like new technological in innovations, and the turbulence they bring, it's important, when these new things hit the way people work, they bring turbulence. And the turbulence they bring is not something that many schools and school systems will know how to do. At least it, that has been the case for the past quarter century. So the question I want to leave you with, how do we interrupt that? And are we up to the task of building a learning sciences of proper and efficacious execution. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Very, um, I, w I was trying to think what are the kind of not commonalities, but maybe connecting themes between these two presentations, which come, I think, at, I mean, the problematic situation from different directions. I mean, Jim G talks about, I mean, being inspired from his observations on games and uh, affinity communities, and Lewis from his work with large districts and kind of trying to understand on how we can make change. And there were two aspects which kind of uh, struck me. One of them is, of course, I mean, this perspective on coming from games. I think we actually have a long history in education on being informed about learning when we step outside our usual realm. I mean, it started with philosophers who for hundreds 
hundreds of years speculated about education before somebody like Piaget came along and said, uh, let's not shit in the armchair anymore, but actually study on how kids build knowledge. And you know, he studied his own kids very intensely. Then people moved into the laboratory and after some time realized this really wasn't enough. We needed to go into the places where learning and teaching happened, i.e. the classroom. So we had a big shift actually in research moving out of the laboratory and classrooms. And then researchers like Jean Love and Etienne Wingern came and said, classrooms are not the only place where learning happens. Let's look at the workplace where people on a day-by-day -day basis uh, across their life learn. And so I think what Jim opened with games was again, I mean, a concept, actually a context which we did not consider to be appropriate and valid for learning to open our eyes to what uh, actually a promising learning environment could look like. I think he didn't argue that now everybody had to play a game in order to be a good learner. That was kind of one of the misleading directions where this work has taken. Yes, games can be compelling learning environments. But what is also interesting about learning is this concept of failure. I mean, when you, when you play a game, you're constantly engaged in failure. And uh, I think what Jim wanted to point out, designers are really good in kind of finessing failure. You know, they make you feel just enough so you don't give up. And I was struck when Lewis talked about, I mean, the failure in innovation. Likewise, I think we have come to expect innovations to be failure free. And that, I mean, if we, if we start with this assumption, we'll never be successful. And so we rather, like game designers maybe, should approach system innovation from a perspective that failure is something we need to pay attention to. And then we have actually an opportunity to achieve equity, I mean, to make improvement. And so I think there's overall I, uh, a more recent attention to failure. Manu Kapoor has talked about productive failure, but people realize immediate success is maybe not always, I mean, the recipe for success. I mean, we're not learning in a uh, gradual improvement. We learn through hoops and uh, stumbles, and this is true not just for the individual, this is also true for systems at large. I think the second point, which is very interesting in comparing both presentation is this focus on community. And so Jim, in looking at gaming communities, introduced uh, the concept of affinity cultures, or other people have called it communities of learners, of practitioners, but this idea that people don't play video games all by themselves. You know, this is a popular media image of the boy and gross staring at the screen, not realizing that in fact, I mean, you can uh, check with magazines, you go online, I mean, you're part of fan communities, there's a whole community which actually helps you to succeed. Uh, and likewise, when we do innovations, it's not just a top-down approach. I mean, there are many, many stakeholders who are part of this process. I'm sometimes a little bit worried when I hear this overemphasis on affinity communities, because I think these communities are self-organized by people on their own volition, whereas a lot of us on what we deal in schooling is compulsory. After all, here um, in the United States and many other countries, you know, we have compulsory schooling, so there is a system in place where everybody uh, at least has to participate unless they um, opt, opt out. And the reason why I bring this out, I mean, as one of the co-developers of uh, one of those very successful affinity communities, Scratch, a use programming communities, I think we're often blinded by the massive numbers of participants. Right now, I think there's about 10 million kids programming, 20 million projects, and every day that number is growing. But I actually looked a little bit behind the curtain by studying kind of the patterns, uh, drawing a random sample, and I was kind of surprised to see, yes, I mean, there's about 10% of kids who uh, 
uh, participate very actively in many complex forms, but the large majority is kind of more hanging on the sidelines. And then when I did a con longitudinal analysis, I noticed that the, the patterns of participation which kind of lead to more engagement are far and few. Many people actually don't kind of um, change over time uh, to those more involved forms of participation. So I think we have to be very careful when we take something which works very well in this particular setting uh, and think A, that A, everybody benefits and everybody participates, that there are actually large inequities on who gets to join those communities and participate. And I think it raises a larger issue on how we can kind of mitigate these um, inequalities in access uh, and participation, because I think the goal for both Jim and Lewis is that, I mean, everybody has a chance to participate. The doors, I mean, of the clubhouse, to quote, one of Jane Margolis's earlier work on the communities of computer science, you know, should be open for everyone and we should get access and support to participate. Uh, and yes, I mean, these communities are open, but not everybody gets to participate. So I wanna leave this here and maybe uh, give um, uh, Lewis and Jim a chance to respond, but then I wanna also open it up uh, to others to to see what kind of questions you have and how we perhaps together can think about what are some of those challenges as well as solution and uh, what we need to address in learning sciences and education at all. So, so, so we only have one mic. Yeah. So be very Let me say uh, quickly, f so I use the word affinity space because I don't want to use the word community because uh, that word has so many other meanings and some of them are romantic and some of them are not. Um, but uh, Yasmin has hit on a very important point. These affinity spaces, whether they're for chickens or you're doing um, fold it and trying to cure AIDS or uh, women's health, it could be in anything. Uh, they're self-organized in part. Many of them are actually originally organized by an institution, but the goal is to organize them in a way that then bottom-up forces reorganize it. The other thing is that they are all operating on the Pareto Principle, which is entirely different than school. The Pareto Principle is that 10% of the people do 90% of the stuff. And 90% of the people do 10% of the stuff. That is how every group of human organization, including publishing and academics, operates. Now, that 80% who does less is called the long tail. And there's a misconception that those people are less relevant. I'll give you one example. And there are companies today that do crowdsourcing. That is, you give a problem to a large number of people, and they, they suggest things and can build in each other's things. And the crowd will eventually get a solution the experts can't get. And companies do this, they pay for it. Now, I was once talking to a guy who runs one of these companies, and I said, well, do you get the Pareto Principle, the long tail? Yes, when people are doing this, and 10% uh, uh, of the people make multiple, multiple, solution, uh, multiple suggestions, and 80% make a few. And I said, well, how often is the solution to the problem that they come up with uh, contingent on a contribution somebody in the long tail made? And he said, always. That's, that's how collective intelligence works. It pools all knowledge. It must have diversity. And often somebody in the 80% knows somebody, something no one knows. So if we wanna push affinity spaces as a way of organizing modern knowledge and passion, we have to say that every child has the right to sample many of them, many interests, and often will be in the 80%, and that will still be a real contribution and then they have a right to find their passion where they can be in the 10%. Because without passion today, given our economy and our jobless future, you are not gonna have a connected life, right? And so uh, that's the shape of the modern world. It, it, one of the things I think we need to talk about is how much can we now get some convergence between the shape of institutions, which Lewis has just talked very well about, and the shape of these emergent 
architectures uh, and uh, in a way that does lead to equity in the current context we have. So I, I, um, I saw, I didn't see this particular overlap between what Jim had to say and what um, I had to say. But I think I'm going to stick with the Pareto principle for a second. Um, I, you know, I think whether you're in the, the I, when I say Pareto principle, I always talk about 80-20. If you're hearing the 20% that's doing the work or the 10% that's doing a lot of the work versus a long tail, there are honest to God work processes in either place. And there, we need to figure out a way to make the structure of work both approachable and understandable for the largest swath of people. Because it's entirely possible, whether you're in a tail or in the hump, that you can be shut out of access to the sort of the, the nub of what it means to do the work well. I, I, I got an opportunity uh, uh, because I, I knew a little bit about social networking to work with a, a, um, a few years ago, to work with a, a young scholar in Germany who was doing some work in, cla in engineering classrooms with st students who had collaborative software. And the thing that was really interesting about the patterns of sharing, the patterns of sharing were not necessarily based only on the content of questions, the content of work, it was based on social connections. And so people who could know and would benefit from knowing were often not a part of the networks of knowing. And we, and so part of the, and, and sometimes I think it's because the work itself is invisible and we don't invest em enough time in making the structures of work so you can participate more visible to more people. So, I mean, I think that whether we're in the old institutions, uh, by summary, or the new institutions, emerging institutions, we have some of the same execution challenges. Well, part of what I'm just trying to suggest, I mean, I, so I think one thing we're converging on here is there's got to be a kind of new architecture that we, you know, we see architecture traditionally as building a building, but now people live in multiple spaces, physical, virtual, and we've got to begin to say, how do we organize those with connection, networking involved? How do we honor people who make the 80%? How do we give them the opportunity to be, in? these are new questions. And it comes down to really asking, when a kid is out of school, that kid can be able to move to many different places. He's not trapped in one place, and he's not trapped in one role. He can be a teacher, but the kid today in school is often trapped in that one room. And I wanna just simply ask, I want the equity question to be, is how many places can this kid go? And how many of those places can he contribute to? What is his mobility? And, that, and, and that's the equity question, but I'm suggesting that it's also the question about the health of our society, because that's the connections that allow that person to have meaning and feel they're participating. I, I would, I agree, and I would offer a friendly amendment to that. Uh, and the friendly amendment is we have to attend to how many spaces kids or adults know how to participate in. It's, it's a, you know, I, I feel like we, as a, as a field, you know, as we mentioned this a little bit earlier, when we talk about our attention to success, we often think that the best of our ideas are in that, we, the that we came up with it, right? The best of our ideas are in that we understand that affinity spaces exist. Well, I think the best of our ideas are, are when we can articulate in detail how 
of Trinity spaces exist and how they become open to everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and what I'm beginning to see is that um, we can't leave this to emergence. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, we do, the, the uh, uh, affinity space and the dark web for identity theft is one of the best I've seen. It is well organized to distribute teaching and learning. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean we want you there. But it means, <laughs> it, it, means, it means though that we have to begin to see teachers as at the hub of a set of spaces. And the important thing for the teacher is not that you know everything, but that you can say to the kid, I know there's a useful door over there, open it and go in it, right? We've gotta to begin to aggregate, you see yourself as an aggregator, a guide, a connoisseur, and saying to the kid who's beginning to get a certain interest in school, here are some places you can travel. Uh, because they're, they're, now you're recruiting distributed teaching and learning. That's gonna require the teacher to become emergently organized into affinity space with other teachers and to quit listening to us baby boomers and other people because the, the job of the teacher is going to be like a Pareto principle. You're gonna, you're gonna say, well, I don't know where this kid could go, but I'm in this group with these other teachers and they know, and pretty soon uh, you're in this distributed system as a professional. It's a wholly different way of doing things. It, um, one of the reasons affinity spaces, including ones where people are doing citizen science, but uh, are, exist today with such passion is people cannot get status on market. We have a country that said your status is how much you make, how much money you're worth, and now next to no one has a, a high paying job or status, and so no wonder we're sick. These people, and they often say it, they're out there getting status, belonging and meaning off market. It, it gives them a life. Now, and, and until we solve the problem, we're on the way to a jobless future that we have eviscerated work, while at the same time saying schools should be about jobs, um, then we have to say to the kid, find some way to have a sense of meaning, even if it's not about money. But ultimately, if a, if a population, I believe this, it's my one piece of optimism, a population who returns, black or white or brown, to a feeling of connection and belonging will never put another Trump in office and will take back the politics of this country. It's not gonna happen tomorrow, but it will happen. Um, but, it, it, but we have to, the equity issues, some kids cannot find their ways into the affinity spaces. They haven't even seen the interest. We have to be their guide. We have to say that we, uh, we've, it's literally access to a space and we've got to open that access. So, Lewis, can you say a little bit more? I mean, the teacher is one important person, uh, but schools, I mean, there's, I mean, um, even you showed uh, a diagram, of a figure with lots of different spaces. What is the role of other administrators or other institutions? Because we can't just put all the responsibility on the teacher to make that happen. There need to be other support systems in place to, that support the teachers, uh, parents, and other groups as well. Since Lewis, since you kind of have that network system perspective, where do you see that coming? How do we get the other stakeholders involved? I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, but I mean, but I have an opinion. I can. I have an opinion, right? Um, uh, you know, I. I think. In, I, I think most. I don't. Know, most is strong because I don't know about most. But it is easy to find examples of schooling and other organizations that are essentially towers of Babel. And by that I mean, they, we got some mission or something, but the detailed practical theory that tells us how to do and execute on what we say as an organization we believe in, it's almost invisible. We have no shared language. We have no shared problems. And without these, right, it's easy to create a world that says, well, it's the job of teachers to get this done. If we had shared theories, if we had a common language of what it meant to do well on the problems we care about, 
then it would be a lot more comfortable for us to say, well, part of the reason for the failure I'm seeing now is that the custodian didn't do his job or her job today with these kids. Or that the principal didn't do his or her job today with these kids. But absent that, right, we have a poster child for school improvement. The poster child for school improvement is teachers. And we have to figure out a way, to, since I won't use the C word, we'll use the A word, we have to figure out a way to create the equivalent of these emergent affinity spaces in physical organizations where we have shared knowledge, shared language, shared commitment to a problem or a small set of them for learners. And until we do that, it's going to be very easy for, 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 for you to say, well, it's the teacher's problem, or it's their parents' problem, or yeah, exactly. it's the kids themselves. You know, there are, there are examples, though, of teachers emergently organizing not only with themselves but everybody else. I don't know if any of you are a member of the Badass Teacher Association. Are, is anybody the member? I mean, they sell their own shirts. I mean, uh, <laughs> But, you know, if you look at what that organization has done, it's very modern. For one thing, they will tell you, I mean, there are a lot of liberals, of course, but they'll tell you on the site, don't bring your other politics here. We are trying to dis defeat this testing regime, and conservatives hate it as much as liberals do, so leave those politics at home, bring your affinity to, for destroying testing here, and we're going to do it. And they're, they, they've written their case studies, they've organized, they've practiced, they've had had some great successes that they've written about, and that and and in, you can join that association whether you're a teacher or not. So here they're uh, organizing an affinity space bottom up, but uh, they uh, uh, they are having an impact. And I think that's a modern thing, and we can learn. So there are cases where teachers are taking on a professional role. Uh, uh, you know, I, I just want to see. Uh, you know, teachers are kind of everybody else supervises them. Right, the superintendents, academics. I want to see us become the service personnel and them the boss, uh, and and support them. You know, we can be the nurses and they can be the doctors. And uh, you know, I, I just I, I recommend if you um, this this last point that Jim made is sort of totally fascinating. There's a, a as an example of it uh, in 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 one of the classes I I teach. I use this, and I spend a lot of time paying attention, maybe for good or ill, I'm not sure. I pay attention to what goes on in healthcare improvement. But there's this great video that was on the news hour, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years ago. But it was about what goes on in uh, Virginia Mason hospitals in, in Seattle, I think. And they talked about just this thing. What happens when you flip and you put uh, nurses and other close-in care professionals in charge of what goes on. And they became a radically more efficient organization. They, they became, nurses became in their language what they call flow managers. Because the only people who really knew where people should go and where the most need was in the moment were the nurses. And and at least the report on the news hour, who knows what you should believe, but because of fake news. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, but, uh, but the report, what both uniform, both people at the top and people at the bottom of the organization said the flip mattered hugely to patient care. And you brought up Deming, and of course that was one of his theories, right? Push the knowledge exists close to the assembly line. Push the choices and the decisions down there, and you're going to get a lot better. You know, actually, that's, it's, that's, it comes from a principle that, that, that Catholicism adopted called subsidiarity. Yep. Right? Yeah, indeed. So, just another question. Yeah. Going this <laughs> I just banged it. Yes, hi, I'm uh, Ben Harold from Edmund. Uh, you, know, you talked about you know, the, the jobless future and part of the role of schools and teachers being to, to open gateways for, for young people to find meaning and connection mm -hmm. if they're not going to be able to find that in the work in the future. And I'm just curious if you listen to anything that you can respond to that. Do you agree with that or how do you do that? Say again. 
I'm sorry. Now that Jim talked about you know this idea of it being a jobless future, and as a, you know in response that part of the role of schools and educators is to help young people find opportunities to make meaning and find value and connection outside of work because there might not be jobs for them to do it. Um, do you agree with that, or how would you? Do that? Well, I, yeah, well. I've, I, I've never been a person who believed that the only reason we have schools or other learning organizations is to simply put people to work or fill jobs that we're trying to make exist. I, I think that, you, I think part of what you said is really important. That our job, I want to use the, um, because I was doing some, we were doing work here yesterday, honoring um, the great Ed Gordon. Um, Ed Gordon claimed, claims, since he's still doing lots of great work, claims that the goal of education is what he calls intellective competence. And intellective competence is the orchestration of cognition, emotion, affect, and other things to help learners in the process of becoming. And therefore, I think that part of the reason to create these new spaces and structures for learning is to create the affordances for learners becoming, becoming sense-making beings. And some of that sense-making is gonna be, I hope, applied to expanding our economy, they're earning a living, but certainly not all of it, and maybe not even the reason to do it in the first place, right? So I think that our goal should be to kinda figure out ways to, to goose intellective competence for all. And, and Ed also makes the point that I think is important to make here that it, these, this is my words, not his, but I think it's true, that the for all part is emergent. The way you get to the for all part is to attend to the needs of individual groups and, 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 and people. And that if you make it, if you get it right for them, all will happen as a function of the strategy. So I think my response to, to Jim in this regard is that in a, in a world where, we, where our economy shrinks and we don't have the kind of work opportunities that we have had in the past, as he said, when we were, for us baby boomers, is A, we gotta work hard to make that different, but B, even if we're slow in doing that, there's a real good reason to create intellective beings who have real great skills in sense making. And who can face, I mean, whatever the future of jobs will be. None of us has a crystal ball, but often when you hear the political rhetoric, people seem to know exactly what kind of jobs. And I, you know, since I'm a computer science educator, this is a topic which is very prevalent right now, and a lot of the push for putting programming back into school is for college and career readiness. But nobody knows what those jobs what kind of coding you will actually know. So I don't think we can make that kind of argument. And I think we're arguing for a more humanistic view of, of education, uh, which kind of also puts civic creativity in thing. I'm very fond of an old literacy definition on what it means to become educated by Sylvia Scribner, who defined, I mean, spoke about three different metaphors of literacy. The first one she called function. I mean, you know, the learning to read and write. And obviously, I mean, even in this room, we have very, sometimes very different opinions on what that means, but we all agree there's a certain level of functional literacy. And then she said there are two other ones which don't often uh, enter the conversation. The second one is a political one, because we become literate in order to participate in the public life and make, I mean, decisions as citizens, and we need certain competencies. And the third 
fourth one, which I hardly ever heard, but I think I heard a little bit in uh, Jim G's kind of affinity spaces, is kind of what she called grace, or what I called personal expression. You know, when you want to write a love letter, okay, today nobody writes a love letter anymore. You compose a tweet of 140 character to vote somebody, but uh, I mean, there, there is a certain competency required, which has nothing to do with having a job or anything, but it is about, I mean, personal fulfillment and helping people to express themselves across whether it's in a written or any other format. And I, I really like, I mean, this kind of multi-pronged way. And I think our discussions always focus just on the first one. Yes. No, and, and very little, I mean, in understanding what we're doing is not just for college and career, but for, I mean, uh, political kind of participation as well as for personal uh, purposes. Uh, and, and I think that's something we need to keep in mind. Oh, that we really raised. Uh, so I'll start with Nancy Law, then here and then there, and I hope I didn't forget anybody here. Sorry, I, I singled you out, Nancy. Um, So first, the implications of the cognitive sciences, my argument is that uh, good affinity spaces, you know, uh, when they're well organized and are resourcing people with passion and interest, are uh, organized very closely to what we know about how human learning works. Right, that it is that it's distributed teaching and learning. It's based on problem solving. It's based on experience, and uh, you know a whole bunch of stuff that uh, I, I think that um, th that needs to be applied back to school. So I think it reflects, at least, it reflects my view of the way we learn as situated, embodied creatures, connected to other people. Uh, the architecture thing just is, it came up to me when uh, some architects at ASU were, uh, you know, going to be asked to build a new school. Uh, you know, replace a building and build a whole new school. And, and and they had read some of the stuff I wrote in games and came over and said, you know, well, what, what, you know, we talked about the fact that today space is not only real. I mean, not all, it, it's virtual and real, and people move back and forth, and they're with people all over, and they're not trapped in one physical or virtual space. And so, what would that mean for an architect? How would you build uh, purposely a sort of affinity space? or sets of them, or access to affinity spaces to resource interest and passion and, and see your tools as not just physical. It's new, I mean, and they had a bunch of students make proposals and do stuff, and it's a hard problem, but it's a very interesting problem. If, if, if it is true that in the world we're entering in now, that your ability to move through these spaces, real and others, with interest and passion, is going to be the only thing that will save you from some of the things that people are doing to workers today, doing to our society, that are going to give you hope and meaning, then we have to think about how to get, in a way, that school back into that sort of Catholic affinity space. That is where it is sharing and teaching and learning across the board for very much what Ed Gordon calls intellective. Uh, competence. Uh, so um, I, uh, it's new. I mean, I, but we've got to begin to think in new ways because the world is different than it's ever been. And we also have to eventually retire us baby boomers <laughs> because we were born in a different world. And we need younger people to begin to not to say there's new categories, there's whole new things to do here. And it has the whole emotional uh, weight of that to me. Yeah. Um, I've, I've even had to go through metal detectors before in Miami. I went to school in metal detector. Um, the whole business model around uh, the food and somebody's relatives got short money to do the food business, whatever, you know? <laughs> so um, I am a strong hierarchy. And if I were to do a, a long term problem, I'm thinking about the built space at this point because I think the virtual space can be more uh, flexible, maybe. But what kind of things can we do? The, the schools are falling apart in many places of the country, and they're going to rebuild them. And what kind of things we, can we do for this um, vision for community spaces, affinity spaces, uh, that will work for this kind of, oh, the time limit? Summer's off, why? You know, right. and, what, what are the priorities there, or is it a priority, is it not important? 
I, we need a new paradigm. I mean, it, it, when Lewis was talking about, you know, these policy changes, to me, and this came out with the MacArthur money that was spent to make the digital media stuff, is there's two radically different views about what to do with these new technologies and their implications. One is, which the Gates Foundation has suggested, is it's unfair not to bring them to everybody all at once. But the danger is when you bring them to everybody all at once, the, the traditional grammar of schooling co-ops it. The other thing is you'll get them, and this is I think what Lewis was saying with individual, you know, you get to, to everybody through being specific. You get it to work in places as a proof of concept and get it done and then it spreads. And there, and there are people on both sides of that of that agenda. But w I, I support the idea that we need to begin to think of a whole new paradigm. It, you know, I, it's literally the case, you know, in c certain schools, kids can't get to an, uh, one of the virtuals. They literally can't get to, I mean, Henry, J uh, Henry Jenkins is a great point when they built a beautiful interactive fiction around Moby Dick. It cannot be used in school because the word Dick is banned in any site. A society that bans kids from Moby Dick because of the word dick is, is a trivial society. And well, I, you know, I, have two, I have two comments to what you just said, I think. One is we don't, and so in part I was, myself, I was guilty of this when I was talking a bit earlier, talking about the people in schools, principals, teachers, uh, custodians. But what didn't I say? We don't empower children. And we don't take, we, you know, this point that Jim made earlier, we don't recognize that the learners can be teachers. And we don't recognize that when the learners become teachers, and, I, and this is to, to sort of Nancy's point about how are we can be different, how should learning sciences be different? We need to have a learning sciences that recognizes that the learners and the teachers can fluidly move from one category to the other, and we need to be able to have the specific know-how to help that happen across multiple contexts. Because it's probably not the case that nobody reads no Moby Dick in, um, in, in, in virtual spaces. It's probably the case that poor kids don't read Moby Dick in virtual spaces because, because we don't have, when, you know, so there's, you need the experience to cause change from someplace. Either you get it because you have um, interesting and powerful sets of social capital that you can take, a, take advantage of informally. But when that doesn't happen, right, it's the ex it is the responsibility of agencies like ours, researchers, and other agencies, school districts, to invest more to make sure that it is possible, right? So if you have routines that allow some schooling organizations to accomplish great things and they cost you X dollars, there's absolutely nothing wrong with pay, paying X, paying 5X to make the same thing happen in other communities. Well, um, I, I want to see school organized differently. I think that the, we, we have subject matters in schools. It, it, basically, I describe subject matters as game manuals with no game. 
right? <laughs> Essentially, uh, algebra, physics, these, these are activities. They're activities that some people in the world have passions for, find really cool. Nobody finds them cool when all you have is the manual, right? Mm. So if schools began to be about the activities and ones that are relevant, and it said uh, the teacher does not have to know everything, and kids get to sample stuff. Imagine, here's, we, we have an idea that a standard should be about like what every American should know about science, right? So everybody should be taught what every American, and, and it works, every American does know the same thing about science, nothing. So <laughs> imagine you were to have a thing that said every kid must find some area of science or math to take a deep dive in and know why anybody would find that beautiful, why anybody would. And then, one more requirement, you have to be able to teach that area to somebody else and learn another area for them. No coverage, that's it. Those people would be lifelong learners for science and math, right? What we, so, it, why, why can't school, I mean, it, we have to believe the stuff we want kids to learn in school is cool. We've made it uncool. So, uh, but you know, by the way, there are kids who uh, go into school and turn down subject matter that they're going at home doing, sure. right, all the time. So um, I, I, I think um, uh, it would be, uh, I think we should also make t teaching a sexy job. We, we make it the least sexy job in the world. It should be an incredibly sexy job. You're the person who's gonna turn on everybody else to create the future, that should be sexy. Uh, you know, how we've made this so mundanely boring is an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, 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 that was the two schools, one in Chicago, yeah, and one in uh, uh, New York, and I've been in the Chicago one, you've probably been in the Chicago one. It, it was schools designed by a game designer, Katie Salen. And what's interesting is not whether you agree with it or not, when you see the design documents, if you're an educator, you'll say, wow, I, I would never have thought of that. And what you realize is that the, what we think about in terms of how to do a school is a tiny, narrow fraction from our professionals of what could be done. Now, in the Chicago one, I was in some classes and incredibly impressed. The kids loved it, and there was a writing workshop, and it was just being done wonderfully. And I said to the kids afterwards, well, how many of you are going to stay here for high school because they're going to keep adding? And several kids said they weren't. And I was just shocked, and, and I said, you don't like this? And they said, oh, we love this school. And I said, well, why aren't you staying? He said, well, well, we don't do that skill and drill stuff here, and the other kids are doing it, and maybe you need that to get into college. You see, the cultural, <laughs> Lewis already brought this, the cultural model that we sold the kids was still in their way. Um, but yes, those are paradigm-breaking schools, and uh, they are good experiments, and we need experiments like that. Not only do we need experiments like that, but uh, you asked why haven't everybody, wh why haven't they spread? I, you know, I, part, I in part think they haven't spread because as Jim said, we sold a bill of goods, but I, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think we know how to make them spread. So back to what should the learning sciences look like? We need a learning sciences of that, right? So you got a that thing makes that makes sense, that people love, yeah. that just has great evidence. And it can be done by the extraordinary best practitioners at the top of their game. Well, we need to be able to build those things so that, you know, like everyday, everyday people like you and I could make those things sing. Right. And that's what we need a learning sciences of. Yeah. We need a science that helps us make things that work every day for everyone. I, I love that closure, in particular since Jim G started out uh, with the pictures of doom. Uh, we actually came to a conclusion where we can think about models, have examples on, for you to think further on what the implications for the learning science and education can be. And with that, I want to thank my two panelists, Jim G and Luis Gomez, for a wonderful presentation and discussion, and you all. Thank you.